Welcome back to the Burn Bag Podcast. My name is Ryan, not joined by Andre today, sadly, but I am thrilled to be joined by a fabulous guest, Ruth ben Giat. She is a professor of history and Italian studies at NYU. She's also an author and political commentator, and we're going to talk about her most recent book, Strong Men, From Mussolini to Present. Uh, it's a wonderful book, Ruth. Uh, I did read it in preparation for today's conversation. I actually also watched uh, your segment in the most recent Vice News documentary about the far right. Uh, that inspired me to reach out to you and have you on the podcast to talk about this idea of strong men. And so thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Sure. It's a pleasure. All right. So uh, for everyone listening, please check out Ruth's book, Strong Men from Mussolini to the Present. Uh, the first page captivated me. Uh, I'm not going to go any further than that, but I just really recommend everyone go out and, and read it. Um, but before we kind of dive into the idea of what is a strong man, who are strong men, I, I think we have to, to back up actually and talk about authoritarianism, right? What is authoritarianism and what is the subset of fascism in, in between that you kind of hone and, and talk about in this book? Yeah, the the book was really, it's an attempt to look at a hundred years of authoritarianism I'm an expert on fascism, written a couple of books on fascism. And so the although uh, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, who was definitely a man of the left, is in the book because he's very tied to certain right wing figures. Um, it's a I wanted to focus on right wing authoritarianism because we know about fascism which was the first stage of authoritarianism. But then, you know, what happens when the fascists die and fascism dies? And so I go into the Cold War right-wing military dictatorships, and I have Pinochet's Chile as an example. And then on to the 21st century, you know, Bolsonaro, Orban, and I have, it's the first book that includes Trump and puts him in historical perspective. So authoritarianism, at its most basic is, you know, when the executive overwhelms the other branches of government and engages in what we call autocratic capture, where as in Orban's Hungary, for example, the electoral system has been purged of opposition so that not only um, the system is kind of gamed because Today, you have elections, you don't shut them down as often. Uh, and so you have to keep them going, but you try and hollow them out. So, um, so authoritarianism, uh, you know, it's, it's many of the things are, are the same in the sense that the, the targets of authoritarianism, of right wing authoritarianism haven't changed that much. It's Jews. It's today. It's also Muslims. The left women are often targets, uh, LGBTQ people. That's a total through line for a hundred years. And the press, of course, um, anybody who can harm the leaders, um, power or expose his corruption becomes a target. And so how did this all emerge? The idea of the strong man, what are the origins? I imagine your book is from Mussolini to the present. Is is Mussolini the first kind of fascist, the first strong man that we've seen in history? Yeah. So, the, so strong men uh, are a subset of authoritarians. And I, um, they are people who uh, use machismo uh, as a tool of rule. And the book is structured around these authoritarian tools of rule, which are propaganda, corruption, the myth of national greatness, um, violence, and machismo. So I really see these people, think of Putin who strips his shirt off, or this kind of brutalist masculinity as a subset. The other uh, concept I work with is personalist rule. And when when a leader kind of um, comes to power and his personal financial and other needs come to determine policy, not only national policy, but foreign policy. So Berlusconi, uh, I start the book with the relationship of Berlusconi and Putin, which uh, precedes, you know, it kind of anticipates Trump and Putin in some ways. And Berlusconi uh, and Putin were extremely close. And Berlusconi took over personally Russia's policy um, and pushed Putin's aims to consistency through, consistently throughout the 2000s. So this personalization of power, <clears throat> where also the leader's party ends up being in part his personal servant. So we had a version of this in the United States with Trump, where <clears throat> one symptom is the Republican Party after Trump left office 
uh, re kept paying his personal legal bills. So that's an example of personalist rule. Um, so that was my, those were my concepts I was working with. Those were my criteria. Um, and to get back to your question, it all started with Mussolini. He is less known than Hitler, but he was the one who wrote the template. Uh, everything from, of course, the first one party right wing state, um, the first right wing personality cult. And he studied Lenin, um, you know, this kind of crackdown, but uh, also a view of racism, which was much more expansive than Hitler's, where he really talked about um, the idea we now know as great replacement theory. In the 1920s, so way before Hitler came to power, Mussolini was talking about uh, the cradles are empty and the cemeteries are full and black and yellow people, as he called them, are overwhelming white births. So he's very he's very full of contemporary residence, resonances, Mussolini today. I mean, it truly is fascinating the, the similarities that we can draw between history, like the fascists of history and some of the fascist elements that we see today. And so I'm, I'm curious about how you've kind of conceptualized this difference between the old authoritarians and the new authoritarians, um, because you, you mentioned Berlusconi, Putin, even Trump versus the the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Idi Amins. Um, because they've had to adapt, I imagine, over history, what are the kind of the through lines that you've seen, but also what are the adaptations we've seen authoritarianism take? Yeah. So it's to be very clear, I'm not, this isn't a book. Um, it's not a book of comparative politics and I'm not comparing say Trump to Hitler. It's, it's a history. I'm a historian. I'm not a political scientist. It's an evolution of authoritarianism and every chapter. So the, the core of the book are the chapters on these tools of rule. So for example, a propaganda chapter, they all go over a hundred years. So the reader can see what stays the same and what changes. So to, to keep with that example, I was amazed uh, the continuity between the principles of personality cults, <clears throat> which there are many even today. And these partly cross borders, I'll give you an example, which is now we see it all the time in Chinese propaganda, um, that the leader has to be the man of the people, so the everyman, but he also has to be a man above all other men. So he's the superman. And he has to be both those things. That tension has to be carried forward. So they're very relatable um, and they have rallies, many of them. They use the latest uh, technology very skillfully, like Modi Instagrams, his his uh, his life, basically. And Trump used Twitter. Bolsonaro used Twitter. Uh, Modi's been very uh, Modi also used holograms. He, they've all been very, very skilled at this. So. So that hasn't really changed over a century. But in propaganda, what has changed is today, and this is the kind of Kremlin playbook that's gotten exported all over. It's not just about um, censorship. So there's silences about certain things and saying the leader is right. Um, but it's also today about confusing people so that you can't know what the truth is. You can never really know. So conspiracy theories, which which were always present, think of Hitler and the Jews, right? That's a conspiracy theory. But today, uh, because of the actions of social media, um, it's it's just it's just much more difficult for people. It's easier to disseminate um, disinformation, and thus that accelerates the debasement of the truth. The, the authoritarian playbook really has stayed the same in many respects, and so. Uh, in order to maybe understand how the authoritarian playbook plays out, I think we should talk about how authoritarians come to power. And you kind of, you track three different ways in which this occurs. There are fascist takeovers, military coups, and elections. I think it'd be maybe useful to talk about each individually and maybe with the, the case. So maybe for a fascist takeover, right? one, what is a fascist takeover and, and how does this, the case of Mussolini maybe embody it? Yeah, Mussolini is very... Um... He's very important to, to know about because, like Hitler, he was uh, invited into power by conservative elites. Everybody knows that story much better for Hitler, the German elites that you know thought they would use Hitler and keep their privileges, so they invited him in. And the same thing happened to Mussolini. But Mussolini had uh, fascism started as a decentralized militia movement right after World War uh, I ended. And so there was a huge amount of violence 
Um, and, and, and there was also, this is right after the Russian revolution, there was a lot of kind of civil strife, but there was a lot of fascist violence. So he gets invited into power. And what's important about Mussolini for, um, anticipating the way things go today is that for three years, he was a prime minister in a, in a democracy. It was a limited democracy, but it was democracy. And during those three years, he did a lot of the stuff that people do today who come to power in a democracy. He, he, you know, he criminalized the opposition. He passed an electoral law that um, Orban has a similar one that, you know, if, if you have any kind of majority, you have, you can get a majority through, uh, if you get any majority at all, you get two thirds of the vote. And so it, it's a kind of stacking. Uh, it, it makes it much easier to have a majority. And um, and then he, of course, you know, kept up violence, low level violence against uh, the political opposition. And um, in 1924, he uh, had he was involved in the killing of the um, socialist leader. And this is very contemporary because the socialist leader, Matteotti, was not really killed because he was an anti-fascist. He was about to expose Mussolini's corruption, that the fascist party was taking bribes from an American oil company. So the first dictatorship, right-wing dictatorship in history, when Mussolini called it in 1925, was to escape a corruption scandal. <laughs> and this is very typical of how authoritarianism continues to work today. Uh, if you come to power in a, in a in a democracy and there's some remnant of open society, you are vulnerable to having your corruption exposed. So we see that all of these autocrats today, they go after, look at Turkey, they keep jailing journalists, they jail, jail prosecutors, they jail judges, anybody who can can kind of expose their corruption. So Mussolini uh, declared this dictatorship and shut down all of the investigations. Um, and then he issued pardons for all the thugs, all the black shirts who had brought him to power. So when you read that history, um, you think of so many things that go on today. Absolutely. And I'm curious how you would compare the case of Mussolini with the case of Hitler, because I think for the, um, as you mentioned, people may know the case of Hitler um, much more than they do that of Mussolini and with you know the Reichstag fire decree, and the the whole kind of history of being appointed and that and then from there engaging in heightened and heightened and heightened authoritarianism. Um, I'm curious where you see maybe similarities and differences there. Well, uh, an interesting thing, even I didn't realize the extent of this. Uh, Hitler worshipped Mussolini during the entire 1920s because Mussolini started fascism in 1919. And three short years later, he was already prime minister. It was like lightning fast. Whereas Hitler, Hitler tried to have a beer hall putsch to imitate Mussolini's march on Rome. It failed. You know, then he went to prison. Then nobody wanted to buy his, uh, you know, no one wanted to publish Mein Kampf. I, I talk about that in the book. He couldn't find any publisher and the Nazi party had to publish it. Nobody, you know, he, he was a loser. And so Mussolini never responded to any of his letters. He was trying to get an autograph. He was trying to get a photo. Um, he really had like a, 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 I don't know, an obsession with Mussolini. And in fact, other Nazis used to make fun of Hitler for having this obsession with Mussolini. And that's important because the, the historical record is always that, you know, Hitler was just the top dog and he invented everything. But in fact, Hitler learned from Mussolini. And then much later, the tables turned and Hitler ended up, you know, uh, invading during World War II, his ally. Right. But um, Hitler learned um, he learned from Mussolini. And by the time it was uh, his turn to come to office and he was helped by the Great Depression. That's why when the Reichstag fire um, happened, he actually had Italian advisors who uh, were his liaisons because Mussolini still didn't want to talk to Hitler so much, even when Hitler started making progress. So he had these liaisons and they kept telling him, don't go too fast. When you get into power, just take things slowly like Mussolini did. And Hitler didn't want to do that. <laughs> he was so anxious after waiting a, a whole decade to get into power that he took the Reichstag fire as an example, you know, an opportunity to have what I call a crisis politics. And then, boom, he had a crackdown immediately. 
So that that covers the fascist takeovers part. But I want to transition now into the elections of standpoint of getting to power. And you mentioned that the Italian advisors, which I find fascinating, it inspired in my mind the case of maybe Hungary, where you have some political advisors from the United States advising Orban, which totally. again, right, I think that the fact that you have far right uh, advisors advising people in other countries is fascinating. So with the case of, of Viktor Orban, who when he was was rising, right, I mean, I think a, a lawyer who was, you know, the pro-democracy movement and then just a complete flip where it, it's, I guess, a great case of this, quote unquote, illiberal democracy, which I think is something we should probably talk about. And so I'd um, love for you to kind of flesh out the idea of getting to power through elections through the case of Orban. Yeah. So Orban is uh, a classic strongman and that he is a total opportunist. And these guys, um, people sometimes say, how come, you know, they appeal to so many kinds of people and they have, you know, housewives and gangsters and all kinds of people who you'd think have nothing in common. But the the strongman personality, they will be whatever they need to be to get into power. So in Orban's case, he was more of a centrist and then he got voted out in the early 2000s. And so he kind of, they're very good at scanning the horizon and intuiting the future, all of them. Trump did the same. Trump scanned the political marketplace. He is a marketer. (laughs) And he saw that nobody was celebrating the extremists and the forgotten and all that. So he addressed himself to them. So in Orban's case, he becomes this, you know, he, he goes to the right and he decides to, to do that. But he's he's helped by these uh, American advisors he has who actually came up with the, you know, they knew you needed an enemy. And Orban was already quite obsessed with George Soros. They, you know, they were friends back in the day. And Soros had actually, you know, funded uh a photocopier, which was a big deal when Orban was still kind of a dissident, although that's exaggerated in his bio. But so George Soros, with uh, air quotes around it, became this device where you could talk about anti-Semitism without saying anti-Semitism. And so now today, George Soros and, and Orban is very active in these far right networks with, you know, now with Italy, with Meloni, with the GOP. He's he's been teaching the GOP how to be uh, autocratic, how to have electoral autocracy. Um, and so George Soros becomes this device to talk about um, immigration. And in fact, Georgia Meloni, again, very close with Orban, has learned from him. She actually believes there's a plot uh, by George Soros to, um, you know, she calls it ethnic substitution. That's her, that's her version of great replacement theory. And that George Soros is plotting to flood Europe with immigration, depress wages for white Christians and real Europeans. And of course, um, you know, have the extinction of the white race. And so Orban has been very, very important in establishing these talking points um, and he's also finally been a very good client of Putin. And even though he, you know, kind of hedged about the the, the war in Ukraine, he was always very uh, against any sanctions on Russian oil. And he won re-election in part because he he said, I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to be for Hungarians. But behind the scenes, he's always been very pro-Putin. And in 2021, he actually uh, celebrated the best year ever of Russian-Hungarian relations. So he's a Putin client. So all of this constellation of things has been very useful to him. And what he's done now after, you know, he's there for 12 years is uh, create this, this, this system where it's very difficult for the opposition to prevail because there are no longer free and fair elections. There are elections But between the opposition having difficulty getting its message across because he's domesticated the media and all the trickery, gerrymandering, things that are familiar to Americans, as well as purging the electoral system and judges of any uh, any non-loyalists, he's created this simulation of a free and fair election that actually is no longer the case. So I do not like and I do not use the word illiberal democracy, which Orban invented. He loves this word because it's a, you know, oh, no, I'm not a dictator. But there's nothing democratic about Orban's uh, illiberal democracy. 
I think it's a fan, fantastic point that you bring up there. And so I, I will no more use the a liberal um, democracy term. Uh, he's clearly, as, as you talk about, a, a strong man and a dictator. He's you know completely destroyed kind of civil society in, in Hungary and just withered away the democratic institutions. And so uh, this kind of brings us now towards the tools of rule, kind of staying in power, this section of your book. Um, and it was very interesting to me to see kind of the the different ideologies or maybe the different kind of platforms and ideas that underpinned the rises of the different strongmen. Uh, again, when you look at all these different leaders, it seems like they're all kind of different. Um, but and yet again, they they use a lot of the same tools to stay in power. And so with that, Ruth, I, I'm curious about is there maybe like a, a commonality there with maybe the messaging or the use of propaganda that how important is like this this idea of the media and propaganda and ensuring that those ideologies are maybe transcend just like the really niche elements of society? Well, one continuity, um, if they come to power via elections, which again, um, you know, Hitler, he ultimately got appointed, but he was building his profile with the public in the 20s. And of course, today, one thing that all of them do is they... Uh, immediately target the press as trying to victimize them. And this is very important. Uh, and, and Trump did this, of course. And in fact, he was hugely successful because in, in America, many people already didn't like black people. They didn't like immigrants. They didn't like you know Jews or Muslims. And, and of course, the right wing media had always talked about the liberal press, but he introduced the press as a political enemy. And the reason that they all do this, even when before they get to power, is it's like an insurance policy because all of them are highly corrupt um, or violent, and they need um, the public to already see the press as biased, so that if something comes out about them, their followers will be like, "Oh no, that's just the liberal media. They hate Donald Trump or they hate Rodrigo Duterte," and so they all do this and. The first uh, and, and Mussolini did this to an extent, but the real person who did this because he was so frustrated he couldn't get to power was Hitler. And I have a um, I have a, a an illustration in my book of so Hitler was banned for um, his hate speech uh, briefly in the 1920s by certain German states. And so the Nazi party made political capital out of this. And there's a. Uh, uh, a poster from 1926 or 27 in my book where today you would say that Hitler was canceled. And so literally Hitler has tape over his mouth in this Nazi party poster. And the caption is of all the millions of people in the world, I'm the only one who's banned from speaking in Germany. And so he set himself up as a truth teller. So this is the point I'm getting to that these uh, these strong men set themselves up as tellers of truths that the establishment and the opposition doesn't want them to know. And this is like catnip for the public. People love this. And so they feel that the, um, so it sets the strong men as the underdog and also as somebody who's going to be authentic with them. So this is this has been used, again, Hitler in the 20s, and Bolsonaro and, you know, and Orban does it to sent and Trump hugely did it. And many Republicans do it. And there's the whole cancel culture, the liberal cancel culture. So every time I see that, I think of that Hitler poster, because, of course, then what happened, um, Hitler uh, got his speech ban rescind rescinded by promising to stop um, propagating hate and to work within the law. And of course, we know how that turned out. Exactly. Uh, in addition to kind of these, the idea of propagating truth or being the only source of information, um, this is really effectuated through control of the media, or whether it's, you know, public media or private organizations. Uh, I think you have a great example, uh, a case in your book with Berlusconi. I think also Putin has through the kind of the state media has done, uh, has done really an incredible job as far as having con complete control over it, being the mouthpiece of it. Uh, but when you look at societies uh, in these different countries with these different strongmen, how are, is there like an inherent trust with the idea of the strongman that, that they are representing like the best of society? Is there like this idea that these 
these men maybe are, are latching on to some, I mean, at least in Russia, which is a country I know maybe the best out of these, that the idea of, you know, strong, strong Russian leader, uh, um, a man who is riding on horseback, right? The imagery that they use in addition to the messaging, uh, that that seems to be right, just a huge common thread throughout these strong men. Yeah. And so there we're back to the personality cult, which, you know, some people just make fun of it. They see these, you know, I have it in the book, like, you know, Putin fishing in Siberia with no shirt on. And it's easy to just think that's ridiculous or laugh at it, but it's deadly serious because This is why the strongman is, that's why the machismo is there. They become through their body and their public performances, even if they don't take their shirts off, the emblem of national strength. But they're also being the man above all other men. One key thing is authoritarianism is about getting away with crime and arranging the state so that you are, that governance becomes self-protection. And here we go back to the personalist rule. And so the authoritarian actually is the man who gets away with things that other men cannot. So people look up to him, men and women, as the holder of this kind of absolute power. And he can get away with anything and they're afraid of him. So it also ties into violence. Um, and Putin in particular, you know, has uh, has been very clear through uh, shootings and poisonings of journalists. Uh, you know, over 20 journalists uh, have been uh, killed. Um, and it's usually for, you know, like Anna Politkovskaya for investigating war crimes or corruption. Um, those are the people he goes after. The mo- one of the most dangerous things to be over 100 years is an anti-corruption crusader. Um and, and and or a journalist. <laughs> and so Putin just uh, makes an example. That's a favorite uh, dictator thing to do, makes an example of journalists. And so that way everybody else shuts up or goes into exile um, or doesn't until recently. And so with Putin, it's interesting, though, because I really think that um, this is not it's not in the book, but in the um, I had a, a paperback edition in 2021, and there's a new epilogue, and it covers January 6. But I also single out Putin because I had this intimation that he had reached his peak, and he was starting to get worried about his position. And so I single him out as somebody who could be vulnerable in the future. And indeed, you know, he he had to start um, using more and more propaganda on his people, and look at what happened to Navalny. Navalny was not allowed to circulate anymore because, and you could say it's not just because Navalny was saying new things, it's because Putin felt more threatened. Um, And a 2021 poll uh, in Russia said that half of Russians ages 18 to 24 thought Russia was going in the wrong direction. And so this this is a setting in which uh, the only recourse that these leaders have is more repression, more propaganda, more corruption, more stealing. And uh, that's not sustainable. It's just not. Without a doubt. And especially as we see this war uh, against Ukraine, Russia invading Ukraine a, a second time, uh, the kind of the the imagery and the propaganda that have come out of this, that you know Ukraine is attacking ethnic Russians. Ukraine is trying to, with the United States, attack Russia. And so these this idea of creating a, a common enemy um, but also maybe a, a distractor. Do you think that at least for Russia's uh, reinvasion of Ukraine, is this more of a protect Putin to ensure that the maybe the domestic uh, fire is kind of put out to it because they have an external kind of enemy now? Or is it more so of Putin trying thinking that he can remake Russian greatness and that this is something that he must do for the motherland? It's 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 both things. And so one of the in the chapter on national greatness, I point out that and it's this is another thing where it's like everybody does it. They do it in a different way, but they all do the same thing. On the one hand, uh, these strong men promise utopia. So they're going to make the nation great. They're going to have a what I call the ch- chapter title is a greater nation. So they're going to pursue some kind of imperial grandeur for the nation. So that's utopia or or Hitler, you know, engineering a better race was his utopia, let's say. Mussolini, you know, had his own trains running on time, all that. But it's also nostalgia. It's so for so the Trumpian, the MAGA thing, it's not making the nation great. 
it's making the nation great again. And the again is the nostalgia. So there you could slot in Putin where some people point to Peter the Great and others, you know, to Stalin or whatever it is. It's some kind of imperial grandeur. And Erdogan is trying his best to revive some kind of myth of the Ottoman Empire. Mussolini had the Roman Empire. They're all doing this. Um, they all do it. And even Trump was it wasn't a specific empire to revive. Um, so it was like turning the clock back to a time when white males were not threatened, when there were no horrible Hillary Clintons on the scene running for president, uh, when blacks knew their places, all of that stuff. But the the making the nation great again is important. Now, in the case of Putin, though, I it, a very it was very interesting because so I'd had this kind of uh, intimation, and then they had the summit in Geneva with. Biden. And I was doing live coverage for NBC. Uh, and I just started to get a really bad feeling that Putin, you know, he's practiced, you know, Masha Gessen says the man of with no face, right? Um, so he just sat there like seemingly impassable. But I just thought like he's highly threatened by Biden coming and ha- being such a strong voice for, you know, America as defender of global democracy. And so I wrote, I have a a newsletter called Lucid on Substack. And that night I wrote that this summit could could cause Putin to act in a reckless manner, that he he might do something. Because I have immersed myself in the heads of these guys for years and I I have like a sixth sense. (laughs) So sure enough, here we get to, he's, you know, going to invade Ukraine. But this was to me, a classic example of something I talk about in the last chapter of the book about endings. It's called gambling for resurrection. It's a political science term. It's when they think they're going to be going down or they're going to be weakened in some way. And this is what I was talking about before. I really think he, 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 he was at his peak and maybe he's ill, maybe he's not ill, or they have intimations of mortality, whatever it is. And so they want to do the grand gesture that will secure their legacy in history. And because of the way their governance is structured, they they don't listen to people. They have very tiny inner sanctum. I talk about that too. And they believe their own propaganda, they're paranoid. And so they make these rash decisions when they do this gambling for resurrection, because that's a sign that they're in the late autocracy stage if they do stuff like that. Like Mussolini did this, like, you know, yes, I'll send people to the Russian front with Hitler. Like he doesn't, they didn't consult with their generals. So Putin, he didn't really consult fully with his military. He didn't game out the uh, effects of possible sanctions with his experts, even though they had the 2014 experience. He didn't really consult with enough people. And so two days after this invasion started, I wrote an op-ed for MSNBC. And I was like, this isn't going to go well. <laughs> this is going to like be really bad for Putin. And everything I wrote has come true because in, in, indeed the exposure of the Russian military is just ravaged by corruption. So in some, or, in some we can see this, um, this whole thing so far, uh, the way it has gone for Putin as like bringing the curtain back, opening the curtain on the um, ruins that autocracy brings to a society. Um, think of the 300,000 plus young Russian men who are fleeing the country so they don't have to get, uh, they don't have to serve Putin. These are signs of immense failure. It's an absolute failure. And uh, it's, I think everyone's asking the question, what happens now, right? What does the future hold uh, for Putin? And and you have a great chapter in your book, a great section called Losing Power, uh, and I, I'm, I'm very curious as to right, when you've looked at all these different histories, all these different strong men, um, what is kind of the most obvious kind of collapse? Is it from above? Is it from below on the outside? It seems like a lot of these leaders fell because of overextension and either and the you know, kind of their base of support fell from under them. Yeah, overextension is a problem when they do things out of hubris. But um there's very good political science uh, literature on this. These personalist rulers, they have a, I've forgotten what multiplication factor right now, but they have a highly uh, more elevated um, chance of being kicked out 
um, and leaving power involuntarily <laughs> because because when they wrap power all around themselves and they create in Russia, you call it the power, the power vertical, then they are the ones who are at the top and responsible. So there's no, there's very, there is power sharing with oligarchs and stuff, but the power vertical means something. And so they become more vulnerable. So, so you have palace coups. That's what happened to Mussolini. Um, his own fascist grand council decided he was incompetent. It's very dramatic. Um, you know, the allies landed in Sicily. Things were already going very badly. And the allies landed in Sicily and Mussolini was just out of touch and he wouldn't take advice from anyone. So they did this palace coup and they had him arrested. And then of course, Hitler rescued him and there was like round two, but that's, that happens to people. And I never speculate publicly what's going to happen to Putin, but you know, people publish on these things. Uh, A palace coup could be, uh, could come. Um, And again, it's important that, at, just as in the case of fascist Italy, the people getting rid of Mussolini were not anti-fascists. They thought that he was incompetent and he was ruining fascism. So getting rid of him was a way to preserve um, their power, not to crash the whole system yeah. down. But when you see these strongmen fall, what what happens then? Right? I mean, you you see maybe in Russia is a great example of authoritarian after authoritarian. You look at Germany, we go from Imperial Germany yeah. to Weimar Germany, then to Nazi Germany. And so it, it it seems like sometimes when these strongmen, these personalist regimes collapse, it just allows another authoritarian to to kind of fit right back in. Yeah. In fact, there are interesting studies that we we perhaps think about. Germany post-war and democratization, but that's not the norm. Um, Over 50% of the cases, you have some other form of authoritarian rule, because there's lots of types of authoritarian rule or a liberal rule that comes back in. Um, And, you know, I've been writing a lot about um, American politics and how even if uh, we don't know what will happen with Trump, but... um, when somebody like Trump comes in and then is perhaps too much of a loose cannon for conservative elites who used to back him, it's not that they want to go for a Democrat. They What they want is somebody who is a more disciplined extremist, and that would be Ron DeSantis. Or the case, um, the case of, I just wrote something for MSNBC on this. Look what happened in the Philippines, where you had Rodrigo Duterte, who was totally, a total loudmouth total outrage specialist, Um, just as Trump said, you know, I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone. Like, that's not a very cautious thing to do. It worked for him. But Duterte would say, you know, when he was on his campaign trail and and after, he would say, I love killing people. I've thrown people out of helicopters. I do it again. So when you have somebody like that, all this outrage, so who came in after? Well, Bong Bong Marcos comes in, and he is a smoother... (laughs) Um, quieter individual who, however, represents the bloody uh, dictatorship of his father and doesn't show remorse for any of it. But so that it's a way to keep the autocracy causes going, but not have somebody who's a liability. Um, and, and in the case of Duterte, he decided to stand down and his his daughter is in there to guarantee his legacy. Um but that's that's a typical thing where Bong Bong Marcos is not an outrage specialist. He's a quieter uh, version of, uh, of of a liberal rule, let's say. So, Ruth, as we look to the future, as the you know the peoples of the world look to ensure that strong men don't take power, what what are the ways in which you push back against authoritarianism? Are there are they, is it institutional? Is it information? Are there opportunities? What are the ways in which uh, that people can push back? So I have a chapter on resistance, and it was uh, quite a relief uh, to write it because uh, it, it it came after the chapter on violence, which was not pleasant to write. And so there, too, I was looking for recurrences, what works, um, and, of course, nonviolent protest at the right time um, can be immensely effective. And that has taken so many different forms um, from, you know, huge manifestations. Uh, and and by the way, we we know that autocracy is spreading, but we don't hear as much 
about um, this new renaissance of nonviolent protest because 2019 was the biggest year uh, on record for nonviolent protest. And so if we think of what's going on, for example, in Iran, I look at that and there's a long history and I documented in the book of um, not just kind of mass demonstrations that are going on, but using the body, you know, how the women are it's incredibly brave. They're standing and they're cutting their hair. Um, and so these are things they're doing to their bodies. There's a whole, um, a whole history of this around the world where the body becomes uh, a very effective um, agent of protest, let's say. So that's important, but elites are also important. And uh, I think it was the politi political scientist, Jennifer Gandy said, elites make and break the strongmen. And at the right time, elites can defect. It's called elite defection. And I've been waiting to see this in Russia. And we have little signs of it. And then, of course, people fall out of windows or go into the hospital and they never come out. And so then people are too scared. But that goes that can go with a palace coup, but elites if elites can um decide that uh, the strongman is not uh in the right direction of history and they want to of course preserve their own privileges so then you can have alliances uh with um mass protests sometimes um you had a little of that at the end of communism so that's that's another thing uh always watch what what elites do. Um, and of course, it's very, very dangerous in places like uh, Putin's Russia to speak out. But we've had extraordinary things happen. You know, I, I was blown away by um, these municipal municipal councils in Moscow and St. Petersburg. They passed resolutions saying that Putin should step down. This is this is unbelievably brave. And that's that's a form of elite defection. Yeah, I think the subnational authoritarian authoritarianism, but also subnational democracy, is a very interesting thing that I, I've you know, seen political scientists and historians explore uh, as well. Um, Ruth, as someone who covers this every day, who thinks about this all the time, are you optimistic about the future? Should can we come away from this with <laughs> maybe any, any sort of semblance of hope? Yeah, you know what, I am optimistic because although things are are not good now. It's really because, um, you know, this this cohort of strongmen is is, you know, some of them are are like I think Or Orban is like what sixty, but the others of them are not getting any younger. They're kind of aging out, and they're they're grasping at things because I think they know that their time will be up, and there's a whole new uh, paradigm of leadership and a new desire for justice uh, for actually of Generation Z and to save their lives by acting on climate because authoritarianism is linked to, you know, plunder of the environment. So I am optimistic. Uh, it may take a, a while, but um, I think that we're going to have something new. Well, Ruth, thank you very much for a wonderful conversation today. We covered a lot of different topics. We covered 100 years uh, of history. And so for everyone listening, please make sure to check out Ruth's book, Strongman. It's in the episode description. And you also have a new uh, subscriber to your Substack, Lucid. I'm very excited to subscribe to that as well. And so once again, Ruth, thank you very much for joining me today. Sure, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>